Hello, everyone. Welcome to Embracing AI Tools in UX Research. I'm Natalie Bush with Bold Insight. Over the next 30 minutes, we will be diving into our findings from a 24 country study of how AI tools might change the way that UX researchers live and work. This presentation will be recorded and available after the webinar. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Lindsay DeWitt Pratt, PhD, Senior UX Researcher at Bold Insight. Lindsay, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, for taking a little bit of time out of your day to talk about what everyone is talking about, the talk of the town, as it were, of this year. So I'm Lindsay DeWitt Pratt. As Natalie said, I'm a senior UX researcher at Bold Insight, and we are a full service UX and human factors research agency based in Chicago and London. Um, I've spent more than a decade in research, plotting my journey through ethnography, education, and UX research, and I'm really happy to be here today to share some stories and data about that hot topic of the year. Data and machines, AI and humans and curious researchers, how does this all fit together? And where's the future heading? What are we going to do in the face of the news that's flooding in and tectonic changes that are affecting our industry or that might? Well, our team's been thinking about AI and UX for years, and two of our managing partners wrote one of the first books on the topic. And back in March, we set out to better understand a few questions. Um, here's the key ones we're going to focus on today. What are attitudes toward Gen AI among UX researchers? Have they changed over time? How do they vary globally? What do UX researchers know about generative AI? How can Gen AI support UX research or not? Who's using Gen AI, Gen AI tools and how? How are agencies and rules, uh, agencies setting rules and shaping how we use Gen AI? Now to answer those questions on a global scale, we connected with our global network a network that's 10, 15 years in the making and that covers over a hundred markets. We absolutely love our global network and I have the great pleasure of working every day with many of our partners around the world. 21 of those agencies enthusiastically participated when I reached out back in March and I see some of you on the webinar here today. I wanna start with a thanks and end with a thanks. You rock and you made this study possible. And so back in March, when we thought of our global network, we thought of our global work, we do a lot of global work at Bold Insight, and we thought about Gen AI, we had a light bulb moment. We wanted to, on the one hand, take the pulse of the global UX research community on this hot topic, and to track that over time. And on the other hand, we wanted to create a data set that we could use for internal experiments with Gen AI tools. So here is what we did. We reached out to our community and we talked in depth and over time with 51 UX researchers. Our participants spanned an even mix of age, of gender, of experience levels. Uh, they hailed from many, many locations and spoke lots of languages. In total, our IDIs spanned 24 countries and 28 languages and dialects. And now I'm gonna talk about the first half, uh, what we found. Uh, this will be a sampling of our findings, and the full report is going to be available for download in early January, so stay posted for that. Let's go question by question. First, what are attitudes among UX researchers toward Gen AI? Change over time, global variance. What's going on here? When you hear the words generative AI, what comes to mind? We asked, and here's what we heard. From March to December, generative AI tools, general tools like ChatGPT, first and foremost, Dolly, MidJourney, uh, they stayed top of mind for most of our participants. Uh, but we observed some really interesting changes among the hodgepodge of other responses. Some perceptions, as you can see, fell off the map entirely. Robots and sci-fi specifically uh, didn't hear about those anymore after March. Other topics came into very clear relief. 
specifically productivity gains and automation efficiency. So what Gen AI can do for us as UX researchers. And everyone without exception became familiar with those words, generative AI. And we, when we look at the segmentation, the split of attitudes, we see that they started out very mixed. We went from, we heard feelings of childlike wonder in Peru. We heard about cat and mouse game reflections in Portugal. Glimmers of hope in Jakarta. And a, a lot of cautious optimism like what you see in Montreal here. All for it if it helps us, but doesn't do our work for us. And when we think about how attitudes changed over time, well, you see on the left here, this was our interest rating. So perceptions in terms of interest and enthusiasm, that didn't change. Throughout the year, the appeal of Gen AI held really strong among our community of UX researchers, and it stayed mostly positive. But we did see a split uh, within that. Increased hope for some, just over 30%. The exact same percentage of excitement waning for others, and a lot more of the same mixed feelings. And as to the question of how attitudes vary globally, to understand this, we took a different approach and looked to connect the dots between our interview data, our global network, and the much bigger picture. So we conducted a comprehensive desk research project in parallel to the IDIs and the rest of the study that I'm talking about today. And we analyzed more than 400 global media articles on the topic of Gen AI. And we targeted 19 markets that were included in our study, focusing on detailed reports, so not just shared news, uh, news bulletins or briefs. And we did this in local languages. And what we found was a spectrum of attitudes, as we did with the individual uh, study data, a majority with a neutral stance, followed by a significant share of positive and then negative sentiments. And what's really interesting here is that the findings on this global mainstream media scale really closely mirrored the insights from our in-depth interviews. And when we, dig, when we dug into regional nuances, we saw um, a few interesting things as well. So in Europe, the media was really striking a balanced mixed tone when compared to the whole lot of media we collected. And in contrast, the narratives coming out of North America and South America had much sharper edges, uh, specifically skewing toward the negative. Whereas in East Asia, uh, the media coverage really stood out with its upbeat presentation of, of AI. We'll talk more about this in our full report too, but here's just a, a sneak peek at that. So the takeaways in terms of attitudes, uh, individual, Opinions really mixed, but lean toward the positive. Global interest in Gen AI high and stable with that uh, even split of sentiment. And then zooming out to the macro picture too, a watchful yet optimistic engagement with Gen AI. Next up, what do UX researchers know about Gen AI? Some more data for you. So on average, the UX researchers we spoke with had a, a pretty fair grasp of the technology and they scored themselves an average of five out of 10 in knowledge. So of course, much lower than their interest, but uh, a, a middle range, modest knowledge and experience. And across time, we saw patterns of evolving knowledge and engagement that increased for most. So about half of people really dug in to learn more about the tech and get their hands, uh, get their hands dirty, so to speak. And among these trends, we saw, we saw an interesting global trend that, uh, that surfaced across 13 countries and four continents. So from Israel and Moz Mozambique to Canada, India, Italy, Poland, a truly global trend was that self-reported Gen AI knowledge uh, spiked during the year. So if someone reported that they, oh, I think a five out of 10, my knowledge and experience, and then it would go up to eight out of 10. And then by December, nine months later, that knowledge kind of settled. So this signals to us that people, 
you know, there, there's enthusiasm and people are exciting and exploring it and then realizing how much there is to know and also how much we can't know, the sort of black box effect and then having a much more um, recalibrated knowledge level. And when it comes to confidence, how confident UX researchers are in what comes out of Gen AI, that average level hovered similarly around five out of 10 across the year. And for a majority, confidence levels increased over time, thanks to, again, hands-on experience, but also improvements in the tech. At the same time, though, not everyone was so impressed. And for some, uh, the tech itself seemed to drop in quality. Um, the quote's not included here, but another participant even called the tech getting lazy. Some things didn't change at all, and they might not. And by that, I mean the need for human validation, as our Korean participant pointed out. So takeaways here in terms of knowledge, moderate knowledge among UX researchers that we spoke with, that evolving knowledge and confidence with a lot of room for nuance and uh, the global trend of knowledge peaking and then settling back over nine months. Let's see where it goes next year. Next, how can Gen AI support UX research? Who's using Gen AI tools and how are they using them? Okay, lots of numbers and figures here, so I'm gonna take it slow. In March, when we talked to our global community, 84% of people we spoke with, UX researchers, had used, maybe it was once, maybe it was twice, maybe it was for fun, but they had used Gen AI tools back in March. By December, about that much, 82% are actively using some form of Gen AI. And when we peel back the layers and look at usage patterns, Here's what we see on the right-hand chart. So in June, that's the gray bars on the left, we saw an even distribution from non-users to frequent users, meaning that they use the tech four more times weekly. By September, six months after our first interviews, we saw fewer people who didn't use it at all and a trend towards people regularly using. So the middle rising up one to three times weekly. And the fresh data that was rolling in as late as 10 p.m. last night here in Paris, uh, we see a, even more of a shift towards habitual use with notable increases in three and four times weekly usage. So it's definitely taking hold Gen AI tools among UX researchers. And here too, we really see the dynamic nature of Gen AI adoption in our community. About one out of five people in the study have upped their usage, finding uh, new value or really like finding clear value at least in the tools. But a significant third have scaled back or stopped entirely. Again, really interesting movements. There's not one linear picture. And nearly half of our participants have, like I said on the last slide, established a stable use pattern. So we heard lots of stories of, of what we would call power users who are integrating Gen AI regularly and deeply into their workflows, like our participant here in Spain. Some people who are even teaching about the tools and really advocating uh, for more and more UX researchers to adopt. When we think about where, what areas, what tasks, what parts of the UX research process could Gen AI offer support in, here's what we found. So this slide uh, has different colors of bars. Again, these are different responses over time. The light blue and green show the most recent data from September and December. Uh, data, always on people's minds. So it's no surprise that data wrangling, as I've called it, consistently topped the list, underscoring its importance to a lot that we do. Seconds in running might be surprising to some, uh, clearly making waves, multilingual support. Uh, but given that this is a very global study and we have a global pool of participants, perhaps not so surprising. Uh, as I mentioned before, about 30% of what we do at Bold Insights and uh, on the rise is global research. It's all I personally do. And communicating across languages is always a discussion point. And it's very often a challenging point, something we have to work around and we definitely have to consider. And when we look back over the past year and even before 
chat GPT and everything really exploded. Gen AI has really stepped into the language space strongly. There are lots of new products, lots of solutions. Uh, there's really exciting potentials and a lot of mixed outcomes. You'll see here a notable downturn in December. Look at that telling light green bar. It's about half of what it was at the midpoint. So this speaks to the challenges still at play when it comes to using AI-enabled tools to cross language barriers. And I'm going to talk more about this uh, Gen AI and translation, where it works, where it doesn't work, when I shift to our uh, experiments in just a few minutes, the whole type. Here we have a bit more granular script snapshot of the UX research process. Uh, these are emerging Gen AI use cases that I've highlighted in green. Specific activities where participants reported some success in integrating Gen AI. So our data really paints a picture of Gen AI solidifying its role in foundational tasks, as well as in some advanced areas of UX research, complex data analysis, and creative ideation. Not without caveats, and we'll talk about some of those as well. But it's really um, settling into the whole of the flow. But now, behold, the pink. Some of those same tasks, translation, summarizing, coding, and a few others, specifically quality control and knowledge management, those came out in our data as areas of concern, Gen AI pain points, we might call them. So what do we take away from that? So on the one hand, Gen AI use is gaining traction across the board among uh, global UX researchers, but the adoption is varied. Uh, data wrangling and language support is recognized uh, by uh, highly as beneficial areas for application. Whether or not it's always successful is another question. And then these emerging Gen AI use cases, in some cases, they overlap with identified areas that, that are pain points as well like translation, translation and synthesis. And then the last question, question we're gonna tackle for now is how are agencies like Bold Insights and the agencies, the 21 that took part in our study, how are we setting rules and shaping how UX researchers use Gen AI? Looking at the data here, we see that UX research agencies are gradually but slowly shaping their policies around Gen AI. Slow growth and modest growth, 11 up to just under 20% over the year. Uh, still relatively low policy adoption rates. But what does that look like on the ground in practice? I have put on the slide here three takes from agency owners around the world, from Brazil, Japan, and Spain, their reflections on how they're handling emerging guidelines and their practical applications. Some have clear lines, operational versus client deliverable. Some are just honest. If we open the barriers, it's too hard to resist all the things the tools claim they can do and help us with. And on the other hand, um, the company policy in Spain being use it, experiment it with it, find what works for you. So a diverse picture of how policies are taking shape. But still, 80% of agencies don't believe and don't feel like there's a need to set a very clear and hard policy, in part because the technology is changing so fast. Takeaways. Most agencies lack the formal policies, but structured guidance on ethical as well as practical use is materializing. The key focal points, data security, operational use, and human oversight. All right, now onto the second half of our talk, or the second part. A look at some of the Gen AI experiments we ran with our data set. Now, for the experiments I'm going to talk about today, we looked at three foundational tasks, transcription and translation, note-taking, and coding qualitative data. Ready to see what we learned? The first one, transcription and translation. So picture this. You just finished remote global field work, and you have more than 50 interviews to analyze. But they're in 28 languages and dialects. Look at all these languages, Amharic, to Yoruba, A to almost Z. How do you get 28 to your one working language, which is English for me, so that you can move forward in the research process? 
With this selection of AI tools uh, that you see on the right, as well as expertise of native speakers and translators, uh, we tackled this head on. Uh, so let's see how AI tools performed and, and helped uh, help us move the research needle. Working with our interview data in 28 languages came out like this, a very uneven playing field. In this global arena of language and translation, when it comes to performance with AI tools, some players have a distinct advantage. Languages like the green box, those players, uh, English, French, and France, they have a strong assist. Uh, we've heard many stories in our study and we know from our own working in English and other languages, the AI tools are already showing clear and consistent value, but only if you're one of these players. Then we have those in the midfield, the blue languages. Those we've learned have moderate, if patchy success with AI. Some strategic plays that are well executed, but others that miss the mark entirely. But if you look at the largest grouping of languages, the pink ones, those are the ones we worked in for this study, those struggle to even get the ball rolling and current available AI tools offer minimal support when they support those languages at all. The challenges are real for languages and dialects like Hebrew, French Canadian, uh, Hindi, all the other ones you see on the list here and more, an uphill battle in accurate translation and transcription. Even accented English poses a considerable challenge with many tools. Let's dig in a little bit deeper to the case of Hindi. So we conducted a side-by-side -side comparison, pitting human expertise against AI translation tools in various combinations to get from Hindi to English. The results were pretty revealing. We had a human translation to set the benchmark, the green bar on the left. That's the gold standard we aspire to. Now, the closest we came to matching that was with OpenAI's Whisper, a notable AI tool that shows great promise and that works really well for certain language pairs, those green players on our field. It captured 63% of the human transcripts accuracy. Uh, that's the blue bar there. So of course that's not on par with human precision and I'd seriously question any researcher who wanted to use that uh, to get closer to a client deliverable, uh, but it does showcase the strides that AI and speech technology in general has made in the last few years. And there's a lot of promising uh, development on the horizon. But if we move on to other AI tools, those smaller pink bars, you can barely see they're trailing far behind at around 4%. And a lot of others didn't even support Hindi at all. So what's our learning here? Well, it's a very uneven playing field out there as you saw. AI tools and speech technology in general shows varied levels of proficiency and performance when it comes to translating across a wide range of languages. And following from that, Human oversight, and in some cases, human-only execution is critical to ensure language accuracy for sure, but also to make sure that cultural nuance is preserved and protected. Experiment two, UX research note-taking. Here's what we did. Three Bold Insight team members took notes on each of our sessions. We had a whole team of note-takers and they followed our in-house best practices for UX research note-taking. Uh, which is part of our fabulous internal training program. We analyze those sets of notes, for example, the interview with participant 50 you see here, uh, for consistency of hitting our three task goals, capturing relevant data, capturing to research objectives, identifying trends, and giving a leg up on the reporting process. Then we looked around for potential AI tools that could match or at least feel we could be confident uh, at, some level of accuracy. And that led us into a conversation with designers and engineers of a new product on the market. And through a collaborative effort spanning several months, uh, they fine-tuned an AI tool that targeted our style of UXR note-taking. Let's see what we found. So the AI note-taking tool proved to be quite the scribe, turning out a high volume of notes. We're talking 20 to 40 sometimes notes per half hour session. Um, and these were all English sessions. The language options were, were pretty minimal. And if you never loaded even with the English, sorry, Italy, uh, it was an impressive quantity, but as we know, quantity is, doesn't always mean quality. And exactly that became clear when we sifted through those notes. On top on the right here is an example of, well, garbage. We were looking to catch a rating here. That was a swing and a miss for the AI. 
But below, we got a clear summary and a great accurate quote. So that was a good job there. But when we think about that experiment, we saw the AI tools currently on the market as promising, but nothing beats the trained eye. The tech's exciting, but doesn't compare to the trust in our team, which I've pictured here. Our third and final experiment uh, that I'm gonna talk about today, there will be more in our full report, is coding qualitative data. So here you see our master data sheets that our human note takers populated, uh, spent a lot of time really thankful for the whole team that was working really hard to make this project come to life. Uh, the task with this experiment was twofold. We wanted to classify the insights into themes and count the responses, how many people said what. And to do that, we just, for the experiment, focus on one question. In what areas do you think generative AI in its current state is or could be most useful or valuable? We gave that coding task to Bold Insight researchers, separate from the note takers, and chat GPT with the exact same set of instructions. Uh, then we ran a percent agreement analysis of the coded data, which you see uh, in the upper right here. And what we found was telling actually, coder three and chat GPT B coder stood out for their consistency. So this experiment shows something a little bit different, uh, really the bright potential of Gen AI, uh, but it's not quite as simple as pressing go. Creating a prompt that delivered reliable results took a lot of time and energy, frankly. And this raises a crucial point echoed by other UX researchers in our study and experienced by me personally. Are we actually streamlining our workflow with these tools in their current state at least? Or are we just investing more time into mastering them and burning calories? Valid question. Two takeaways from our coding experiment. Big potential with Gen AI summarizing and synthesizing data, but, and it's a big but, there's a learning curve, both for the user, for the researcher, and the technology. Crafting the right prompt takes time, skill, and more than a fair bit of patience. It's a reminder that while Gen AI is really powerful, it still requires a human touch to guide it, and it still sometimes gets it wrong. So what did interviewing 50 UX researchers reveal? We took the pulse of our community for you, and we also experimented with Gen AI for you. And when we reflected on all the promises and the pitfalls, the risks and the rewards, the asymmetries of trust, really, we realized that asking the right questions is the smartest starting point for embracing Gen AI, Gen AI in UX research. So try this out a strategic series of questions. We'd start with AI fit. Ask yourself if the AI tool truly meets a need, if you're just looking to do it because it's in the news and it sounds cool, or if it's something that might just complicate your workflow. And if the benefit isn't obvious, it's probably best to just skip it. Next is complexity. Break down that task and compare it to the strengths of Gen AI. It's crucial to make sure that the AI can navigate the complexity of the task at hand. And then if we're still greenlit, we wanna weigh the stakes. High stakes means more oversight and a possible rethink of AI's role. Low stakes, foundational tasks, perhaps, could be more suitable for AI, but it's not a given. Quality should always be a guidepost, a guiding North Star. What do you need from your data? Is it accuracy? Is it deep insights? Is it immediate utility? Do AI tools or the one you're targeting, does it meet that quality marker that you need? And speaking of quality, human validation, as I've mentioned a few times now, is super key. Double, even triple check AI outputs. Always a good idea. And lastly, keep your focus on the user. Any Gen AI applications should ultimately help us improve the user experience. And if they're not, they're not worth your time. And that's a wrap. I wanna end with another thanks to our global partners and to my team at Bold Insight, uh, everyone who supported this nine month research project. A big shout and cheers to many more adventures. And please stay connected. We're always up for a chat about AI and a whole lot of other research areas. We love research. Uh, do remember, stay posted for a full downloadable AI study report coming your way in early January. Um, we have 
plenty more stories and insights to share with you. Thanks to everyone for coming. I'm going to turn it back over to Natalie to close us out. Thanks, Lindsay. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us today. A recording of this presentation will be available soon and um, keep a lookout for the full report with even more data from this study coming in early January. Be sure to connect with Lindsay on LinkedIn and visit our website to learn more about our work in this space. If you have questions, please send to hello at boldinsight.com. We'd love to hear from you. Again, thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day.